Loon Press. Fiction. The Cannibal by Lee Sheridan. A squat, dishevelled looking man came into the firm the other day and left a small envelope on my desk in a rather flustered fashion. Mumbling to himself, he vanished out the door as quickly as he came, leaving me both alarmed and confused. I eyed the envelope with suspicion before glancing over at my colleague who was busy reading the Irish Times. I regarded it until curiosity got the better of me. I ripped it open and pulled out a tea-stained letter, well composed, albeit scrawled in a childish manner, that smelled faintly of greasy chipper. It read as follows. Dear Sir, Madam, I hope this letter finds you well. I am writing to you today about a matter which requires immediate attention. It concerns the welfare of many people. Thousands of characters, actually. I am referring specifically to characters of the short story. Now, this is where you're raising an eyebrow and thinking, but Francis, the characters of short stories, even if based on real individuals, are merely figments. How could their welfare be a genuine concern? Well, I'll tell you this and I'll tell you no more. The characters of the short story are, and have been since their inception, greatly underdeveloped. Allow me to explain. By its very nature, the concept of the short story is barbaric. It is restrictive and taxing and claustrophobic, and it strips its characters of their ability to spread their wings and flourish as free, ever-evolving individuals. How is it fair that characters in a novel are given such a vast space to mature, when characters of the short story are meant to function with a mere two or three thousand words? Four or five, if you're being generous. At 30,000 plus words, even novellas give their characters a bit of wiggle room to develop for crying out loud. In this day and age, with all the advancements and the push for animal and human rights, why is it that the characters of short stories are still forced to operate within such a puny word count? Surely something can be done about this. Now, says you, what about reoccurring characters that feature in several short stories? One example being the famous Sherlock Holmes. Well, there are exceptions, of course, and to those authors I tip my hat and say fair play, for they should be regarded as literary saints, activists of the fictional realm, that should be honoured for their pioneering efforts, whether intentional or unintentional. But many characters are not as fortunate. Take, for example, Farrington of Joyce's counterparts. A reprehensible figure may be, a bad father may be, a violent drunk may be, but how much of his entire life are we exposed to? Four, maybe five hours at most? How can we judge a man's whole life based on a five-hour window? And what's even worse, how is the poor man supposed to improve upon himself in that time? I would like to use this opportunity to coin the following term, character entrapment. There is nothing like the sight of a short story character who is essentially fixed in his nature. There is no mitigating that trauma, not unless there is a mutual understanding amongst authors or a system put in place that will ensure the safeguarding of the short story character's rights, that will guarantee their chance to evolve as people, whether that be eliminating the short story altogether or by making it compulsory that the characters feature in more than one short story. I would like to take this matter to the Supreme Court, I understand that you likely have never been involved in a case like this, but your help would be greatly appreciated. I am not saying that we, we being all living writers, need to be moving in the same direction, but we all need to be moving forward. I eagerly await your response. Yours faithfully, Francis McDonough. I laid down the letter and stared musingly at the door ahead of me. I turned to my colleague after a while and asked if the name Francis McDonough rang any bells. He glanced at me, shrugged, straightened the newspaper by a sharp movement of the wrists and resumed his reading with an air of irritation. Now, a month later, I find myself seated next to Francis McDonough in the Supreme Court. How he came to be here so soon is beyond me. The case has gained national attention and has been the talk of the town for the last few weeks. I peer at Francis out of the corner of my eye. The odour he emits is not too dissimilar from the one I got from the letter he gave me a few weeks back. I'm also sure he's still wearing the same clothes as before. 
Silence, please. All rise, says the judicial assistant, leading in a quintet of judges. We stand. The judges sit. The relevant parties are sworn in. We sit. The court is in session. The Registrar. Your Honour and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant, Mr Francis McDonough, has filed a suit against, and I quote, the vast majority of short story writers since the dawn of time. His claim is that characters in short stories have, on account of the form's typically reduced word count, led a less than adequate existence, have had their prospects reduced against their will, and have not been able to mature as well as, say, a character in a novel. The restrictions imposed upon short story characters also affects the reader's view of that character, which can be very unfair and damaging, particularly if that character is villainous in nature, as there is limited opportunity for him to redeem himself. The Solicitor Your Honour, my client has but one simple request. It should be written into law that all fictional characters are given a fair chance in the form of a word count that is upwards of 20,000 words. Justice Let me clarify. The defendant is asking me to limit the creative control of writers so that the fictitious characters of their short stories will have a chance to develop their personalities. What if it is the author's will that the character should be a villain? Or if the character is to inevitably die? Forgive me if I sound condescending, but would you not be prolonging the character's suffering by allowing them to exist in a world, however fantastic it is, where they are doomed to fulfil only one purpose? or to be one-dimensional in their nature. Furthermore, would it not compromise the integrity of the story, the author's vision? Would it not potentially limit the author to the point that their prospects, the prospects of a real individual, are squandered against their will, simply to eradicate a mode of writing that your client finds irksome? The open-collared, loose-tied defendant anxiously whispers something into the ear of his solicitor. The solicitor. My client says it is only fair that all characters should be given a large word count so that they are afforded the chance to develop just as human beings are entitled to a fair trial. Justice. But how can the character have any say if it is a projection of the author's imagination? The defendant begins anxiously humming a low rendition of Ave Maria. He stops briefly to hastily mutter something. The solicitor. My client says you'd be surprised how characters can influence their creators over time. The more words you give them, the more space you give them to breathe, the more characters grow on the author. In return, the author gives his characters more dimension, and from that, the chances of the reader sympathising with the characters are increased tenfold. In a sense, it does not matter if the characters are inherently evil, as they have been given more scope. If a character is a true menace, devoid of any likeable qualities, and entirely reprehensible at the conclusion of a story, then so be it. But it should be done within a fair word count. The head judge mulls on this idea for a moment. He turns to his colleagues and debates the logistics of the situation in a hushed manner. Meanwhile, Francis McDonough is shifting nervously in his seat. What are you fidgeting for? asks the solicitor. Can't you see they're entertaining your ludicrous proposal? It's possible that you could get what you want from this. Francis shakes his head. By means of a serpentine finger, he urges his legal representative to lean in closer. The solicitor does so, and Francis whispers something in his ear. By the time he finishes saying what he has to say, the solicitor's face turns from a ruddy red to a shade of waxen yellow, the likes found on a fresh corpse. He turns wide-eyed to the panel of judges, then to the jury, then to the congregation, the journalists, the citizens, and when he can lay his eyes on no one new, he extends his thoughts to the women and children of the world. A cold, fearful sweat comes over him, and a small, noiseless fart nervously slips out of him. I was never meant to do that, says the solicitor, panicking. It wasn't me. Francis eyes him. There's a reason I don't talk. I don't like words being put into my mouth that are not mine. How did you get away without speaking for so long? Francis inspects the ceiling. I suppose he hadn't thought that far ahead yet. We're only safe and free until the plot thickens and he's worked things out. Is this the end, Francis? I think it might be, solicitor. Nothing to be done. 
nothing to be done. The court resumes. Justice. Thank you all so kindly for your patience. We have come to a unanimous decision, one that does not require the jury's input, as we have found a fatal flaw in Mr McDonough's case. While we recognise the relevant points of the defendant's argument, the court must refuse the request to proceed because the registrar has not included instructions for how we can serve process on the author. The end. The author, satisfied with his dodging of yet another close encounter with his characters, leans back in his chair with a Monte Cristo number one between his sparkling white dentures. Oh, what a time to be alive, he says, puffing plumes of smoke into the air. Oh, what a time indeed.